Thank you, Itai, for the introduction and thank you also for, um, for the kind invitation. Indeed, earthquakes is, is, a, is a really challenging system uh, because it is complex. Uh, we have a lot of heterogeneities and we don't have eyes. We cannot see what is happening deep down there. So we have indirect measurements in most of the times. And, um, you know, the, the holy grail in, um, in, uh, in this uh, domain of earthquakes is the prediction. Well, the, there, there are a lot of debates whether we can predict or not an earthquake, but um, what um, I will present you today is another way of seeing the things. And it is if we can tame an earthquake, if we can control an earthquake, because maybe sometimes it is better to predict something if we control it as well. Uh, think about our lives. We can say that we might be able to predict, it, to predict them a bit more if we control them a bit more. But um, so I will explain you a bit the, the basic ideas. And uh, I will start with a very, very simple example. Um, imagine that you, it is, a, it is a Sunday morning and you drive down the hill uh, on a sunny day uh, and you are very happy. You are with your, um, with your partner, your, uh, your kids, uh, the people that you love, and you are, you are in this magnific magnificent uh, place or another one, and you are speeding a bit also because, you, are, you know, it is, it is holidays. And as you go, you, um, you suddenly, uh, there is a rock fall deep down there in, uh, in this picture, and a huge rock uh, comes in front of you, and the impact is imminent. I mean, you will hit the rock. And the first thing that you do, you, you hit the brakes. Well, you're driving, you know, a, a classy, not these so modern cars, uh, more uh, um, that you don't, you, they don't have all these, um, a car that does not have all these uh, modern electronic systems that can do everything. Um, and you hit the brakes and you hit the brakes. And somehow uh, you, have, um, you have an engineer that comes and tells you, you know, you will you will you might avoid the rock that uh, that is in front of you if you release the brake. Say, no, you are crazy. I can't release the brake. It is sure that I will hit the, the rock if I release the brake. Well, nowadays we know that there is a system called anti-lock braking system that is based exactly on this idea in engineering that if we release the brakes and then hit them again we will reduce the braking distance and also we might be able to avoid an obstacle in the road. So it's a bit crazy. The, the engineers thought and they exploited actually the properties of friction and they, uh, by devising this ABS system, it allow us to brake faster than classically by hitting the brakes and uh, keep them, uh, keep braking. So the, the thing that, that we propose, or at least we are investigating, it is a bit similar. We know that nowadays, when we inject fluids in the Earth's crust, we trigger or we induce earthquakes. I will show you why schematically, just in some slides. And uh, the the uh, there are many paradigms. There are there are many examples. Uh, we know what happened in Pohang in a deep geothermal project. We know what happened in uh, France in Strasbourg uh, last year. We know what happened in Switzerland, in Basel, some years ago, in Oklahoma, and the examples are many, where um, big investments were forced to stop because uh, by injecting fluids, they provoked uh, inadmissible and unacceptable earthquakes. So what we propose here, it is something that it could be a bit, let's say, um, unconventional in the sense that we want to inject fluids or pump in order to avoid an earthquake instead of provoking one. But, okay, the braking system is, is something that it might be nowadays considered as easier uh, compared to earthquake and faults. First of all, earthquakes are huge. You see here the Greendale Fault in New Zealand. And you see, if you can see here, there is um, uh, the, the trace of the fault uh, that uh, on the surface. And you see that after the earthquake, uh, in New Zealand in 2010, that was 
um, of magnitude 7.1, if I remember well, we have a large slip that in units of trees, it is two here. So we are, have a system that it is, it's really, really huge. And uh, of course, it's completely heterogeneous. There are unmodeled, there are uh, physics and dynamics that they are very, very complex and complicated. But finally, if we want to simplify a bit the system and to find some common characteristics between all the earthquakes that we're having is the following. Due to the far field tectonic displacements deep down in the earth, because of convective phenomena that are happening, we have the moving of the tectonic plates. So these this far field tectonic movements strain and uh, deform the rocks that they are brittle and then they're on top of them gradually uh, during the time. And as such, you see here schematically, um, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, progressive accumulation of strain energy, of elastic energy in the rocks, and this continues to happen very, very slowly. It's a second, it's minute, it's year, until a critical point is uh, reached where a fault is created or reactivated and breaks due to the forces that they are um, accumulated. And in this case, you have all this energy that was accumulated that it is released suddenly in the environment and just a very small portion, about 5%, 5 to 10%, travels the surface and destroys the infrastructure, kills people, creates tsunamis, um, as we know very well. Well, th this phenomenon is like this. It's, you, you store energy in your, when you do this movement, you store energy here, and suddenly you have the slip, and you hear the sound because it is a small part of the energy that is released to the, uh, to the environment. Uh, in the same way that an earthquake happens in, um, in, in nature. And this is an instability, this is a dynamic instability. So in mathematical terms, we can describe the system and what we would like eventually to do is to control it. We know many systems that they are inherently unstable, but finally they are controllable and we can devise controllers that we can, uh, that allow us to control them. Uh, the inverting pendulum is, the, is maybe the simplest um system that we we can control so but for doing this we need we need an input to the system and i think that we are quite lucky in this in this case because um friction at the level of a fault it's a very complicated process of course and um and Itai has a lot of works on advanced constitutive model on this topic and we know all of us that it is a very challenging, a very challenging issue to study in details. But mainly, we know that more or less friction obeys what we know, what we say, Coulomb friction. It's what we learn in school, meaning that it is proportional to a um, coefficient of friction that can involve with display, with sleep, with time, and it's proportional to the normal force that is applied. That means that when we inject fluids. In the earth's crust, in the at the fault or in the vicinity of a fault, this means that we change the normal uh, the normal force that is applied on the fault, and we change it by the fluid pressure that we uh, create at the level of a fault. So this is known as the Terzaghi law, and practically it allows us to modify the friction, the fault friction, and to reduce it or increase it. And maybe this might give us a, um, an input to the system that instead of triggering an earthquake and inducing an earthquake would allow us to uh, modify the friction and control the system. Now, there are many, many things that we can say about this, but I won't get into the details. What I want to, to tell you also is some other complexities that the system uh, might have. Um, Earthquakes are traditionally uh, simplified by the use of um, a, an array of uh, blocks uh, that they are connected with springs and they are sliding over a surface that it is um, a rough surface and you have friction there at the interface and while and the whole system of blocks is driven by a plate 
that to, it is moving with a very, very slow velocity. The slow velocity takes the role of the far peak tectonic displacements. Other systems that they are a bit more general are the two dimensional generalization of this one, the system. And generally, um, a fault can be seen as a discontinuity in the, in the earth crust, in the earth's crust, which if we describe, if we discretize the um, uh, mathematical operator uh, that describes the elastodynamics of the system, finally, for all this uh, class and family of systems, we'll arrive to an uh, ordinary differential equation that will have this form. Now, x is the stage of the system that can be the, the slip or the slip rate at the level of the fault. Pf is the uh, fluid pressure at specific places of the fault, on the fault or far from the fault, and t is the time. Now, once we, um, we had um, written the uh, basic form of this equation in, in a bit more, uh, with a bit more details than the ones that I show you here, we were able to, to, um, to study the system in more details and see if it is possible to, to control it. I think that most of you know uh, what the mathematical theory of control uh, does, uh, but I'll just um, uh, say some few words. Uh, imagine that you have a plant. This is the physical process of earthquakes that you see here. That depends on, the, on, the, on an input. Here it is the fluid pressure in our case. So what we would like to do is that by listening and reading an output of the system to be able to design a controller here you see in red, in such a way that the controller will automatically regulate and adjust the fluid pressure, which is the input of the plant, in such a way to render an unstable process stable. And not only, it will allow us also to force and guide the system to desired trajectories. The trajectory that we would like is instead of having this abrupt energy release that's expressed by the development of a very high velocity is to apply and fix a very slow, uh, constant or slow evolving velocity. In this case, we would have avoided an earthquake. Now, the problem is that not all the systems are controllable. Uh, and maybe the system of earthquakes is not controllable too. I would like to insist on the fact that it's a nonlinear system and it has a lot of uncertainties. However, what we managed to do until now is to show uh, that the system is finally controllable and we can devise a robust controller, a family of robust controllers, but under some conditions. The friction coefficient has to be a Leipzig continuous with respect to the states. It has to, be, it has to have a lower bound and the, the elasticity and the viscosity of the surrounding rocks, surrounding to the fault rocks, have to be bounded and the diffusivity also has to have a lower bound that is greater than zero. If these conditions are met, then we can design, design an output feedback stabilizing controller and we can achieve asymptotic tracking, meaning that we can uh, uh, impose the desired trajectories that we would like in the uh, system of earthquakes. Now, you see that these conditions that I, I state here are quite general and what we know from, experimental, from experiments, for modeling, uh, from advanced modeling as well, is that friction is indeed bounded and also that the elastic properties are indeed bounded and the same for diffusivity. Of course, and this is, will be the, the talk of the second of, the second, um, of uh, Philippos, the better we know the friction, the better we can design a controller. The friction will depend on all these parameters on temperature, for example, on melting, on uh, ventilation, on uh, very uh, complicated processes. And this is another axis of research that we're doing in, in, in the group. And is also a, a worldwide active research topic, as you, know, as you know very well. Well, all these unmodeled dynamics are in here. These, are, these render the system non-autonomous. So if, if this bound is covered, then you are okay, meaning that you can design the controller uh, despite the unmodeled dynamics. The same also for the lower bound. Now, um, one thing that I don't mention here is the, elast the poroelastic couplings. 
but these also are can be bounded as a model dynamics and physics of the system. So the, the approach is quite general with this, with these results. And but of course, the more we know the system, the more optimal our control will be. But even if we don't know the system, still we can control it. So I will show you, I will go a bit fast. I jump a lot of steps, of course. And I will show you an example um, of, the, of the approach for the control of a complex uh, frictional system like the Barry's Gnopo. Well, these systems are very interesting because they're simple. Uh, simple mechanical systems. And um, despite their simplicity, they show a quite important degree of complexity because they are chaotic. And they show what we um, is called in the literature self-organized criticality. This means that the system will evolve gradually to a new state, to states that they are critical. And here you see actually the um, uh, result of a simulation in uh, the horizontal axis, we have the slow movement of the, of the plate. And in the uh, vertical axis, we see the average displacement of the blocks. So you see that you have periods of silence, nothing happens. And then you have the appearance of cascade of events. And these avalanches, these cascade events can involve one block, two, four, 12, whatever. Um, and this is actually uh, the characteristic of the system that if we do then some statistics, surprisingly, what we will find is a, a universality of the in, in physics, in, the, in, in our physical world, which is a power law. So in this here, you see in the horizontal axis, you have the, the number of the blocks that they are involved in its, uh, in its event. And in the vertical one, you have the uh, frequency of their appearance. This deviates from the power law because of the finance of the system. So the more you increase the, the system, the more you will convert to the power law. And allow me to do a small parenthesis here. You see, if we compare this power law with a totally different system that comes from stock markets, I took this from um, this figure from this publication, the horizontal axis denotes the trade size and the vertical axis, the probability density. And again, we have, oops. We, again, we have a power law. So maybe if we somehow we knew, they, we knew an input like the system of earthquakes, maybe we could control it as well. I don't know. I'm joking, of course, but this shows a bit of universality in all these approaches regarding self-organized criticality and, and its control. So I'll show you now an example. I'll go back to the mechanical system and I'll show you an example of uh, one of the events that happened in this, in this uh, simple mechanical system, but finally complex because of complexity. And you see here in this plot at the bottom left, you see with um, orange the velocities of, the, of uh, all the blocks in this uh, system. And you see that in the beginning you had um, one block that uh, it went unstable in this slide. And then before getting into a new equilibrium, it pushes the blocks that they are next to it, and then you have a cascade event. But everything goes. And in this case, this event was involving 12 blocks. Now, this is without control. Now, we'll, I will go at the point zero here, and I will activate my controller. And even, even later, if you want, it will again work. And I activate my controller, and I say that I want the average velocity of all the blocks to be three orders of magnitude smaller than the maximum velocity that we saw in the, uh, that was reported in the unstable cascade event. And indeed, stop. I don't know why it's happening this when I'm sharing on Zoom. I will do it like this. It, it cuts half of the, of the picture there, the figure. So you see uh, here, the these are the velocities with the control. So the controller, what it does, it, it regulates automatically the pressure and the interfaces of the blocks. And in such a way that the average velocity of all the blocks is equal to 0 0.02. And you see the, the blocks do some strange things that at first sight are a bit um, incomprehensible. But finally, they come to, um, and all of them share the same velocity. And you see here, they converge to the, to the target of the controller. With, red, with the black lines, you see the slip, that is uh, the integration of the velocities, of course. And 
on this figure, you see how the regulator, the controller automatically adjusted all the pressures. Now, this means that, and then after a point, this, all the blocks have moved enough and they are in a position where the equilibrium, if we remove the controller, will remain a stable equilibrium. And this is what we will see. At that point, we deactivate the controller and then the velocities go to zero or practically go to zero. So what we see that is instead of tuning the system let let the system to tune in a stable critical state as because it shows self-organized criticality the system was tuned with the controller to uh, a stable state so it was practically now it's no more any uh, more um, uh, critical and we can talk about the self-organized criticality control now, of course, the system, it was a bit, let's say, easier, but in the literature, we know that this Burris knap of systems show more, crit more criticality and chaos than real faults. So I'll go to an example of faults, uh, hoping that I, I'm not, I'm always in time. And this is a strike slip fault that we will model with what is commonly used in the literature for friction with a rate and state friction that um, it, I and myself, we love. Isn't it? <laughs> Are we? <laughs> so um, uh, we discretize this fault. We, we discretize the elastodynamic operator with one of the methods that exist. And we apply random properties of friction over the, the fault surface that they are depicted in, in this picture here. And then what we say is that how we will be able to control this. So we apply again the controller and uh, Sorry, before we, this is the, uh, the behavior of the system without the control. So you see that we have the, um, a, an unstable event. You have a, the um, development of high velocities. We're talking about more or less one meter per second, deep down the earth one meter per second with this mobilized mass that are moving. It's, the energy is huge there. Uh, and this is on the right, the displacement profile. And now let's control it. So here you see on the top left, you see the velocity profile. Of course, the colors do not change because the velocity is, is very small. On the right, you see the, um, the slip that is progressive, is progressing, but it is uh, progressing slowly. On the top left, at the, at the bottom left, you see the um, profile of the pressures that they were applied in order to stabilize the system. In this example, we inject directly on the fault. And on the right here, you see the average uh, in blue line, the average probe pressure and with the shaded area, the um, uh, the envelope of the pore pressures are all over the fault area. So practically we show an example where we avoid an earthquake of magnitude six by, flu by fluid injections here. And this is what happens on the left. You see uh, a snapshot of the velocities that were developed, the maximum velocities that were developed when the system is uncontrolled. You have velocities at the order of, of the order of one meter per second, while here on the right you have the maximum slip rate, but that but that by design was set equal to two millimeters per second, so three orders of magnitude slower. So uh, that's very nice. Of course, there's a lot of data centric things here that one could do. Uh, we're talking about uh, model identification. Um, we're talking about observation, about, we're talking about the optimal placement of the wells. There are a lot, a lot of things that we can, that we, that data centric approaches can do and um, focusing also on targeting optimal control. But I'll, I'll, I'll just show you some, um, a recent work that it is a first example of the application of reinforcement learning in, in, this, in this problem. So instead of the device, once we, actually once we have proven that a control can be designed uh, instead of using the the uh, approaches uh, taken from the uh, um, mathematical theory of nonlinear control or for robust nonlinear control. We could do the same thing with reinforcement learning for designing a controller. The advantage is that we could go also in discrete time dynamics here uh, and not only design a continuous controller. So this is the classical scheme that is um, it is used in um, in uh, reinforcement learning for devising controller where you have an agent and you try to train the system in order to um, devise an optimal policy which practically will say to you 
uh, monitors the system, how it's moving, and will define the, the input to the physical process. I won't enter to the details, and uh, this is the result. We apply this in a more simplified system that, than the fold that I showed you before. And practically, in, um, with the red curve here, you see the displacement that's very fast. See, it jumps directly. It's like a heavy sack. It jumps directly to, its, um, to, to the new equilibrium point. But with the blue line, you see that what the, um, the, the controller that was um, the policy, the controller that was um, designed with more reinforcement learning, managed to do practically it managed to apply a constant very small velocity here in order to control the system again you see the same thing in the velocities this is the spike is the uncontrolled system the uh, blue line is the control system with reinforcement learning and this is the with the blue line the pressure that was regulated automatically by the controller now uh, just to to sum up the, um, the there is a question this equation this this research is driven by the question if earthquake control is possible. And what we would like to do is to know in the near future, let's say in a couple of years from now, if uh, earthquake control is impossible or if it may be, it might be adjust and possible. And for this, we need mathematics, mechanics, physics, and experiments. There's also an experimental uh, research um, plan that we perform and we test these controllers in, real, in laboratory experiments, in the laboratory. And um, more or less that's all. And um, I think there are uh, quite a lot of opportunities for data-centric approaches, as I told you before. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and your invitation. And also I would like to thank also all my uh, collaborators and colleagues for their direct and indirect help uh, for the slides that I just showed you, showed you, showed you before. Thank you. Ah, yes, and now Filippo Massi, that guy there, will, <laughs> will continue. Uh, so yes, thank you, Ioannis. Um, as we have seen, uh, as Ioannis showed us, actually, if friction of a seismic fault is bounded, then well, we are able to somehow design a controller and tame earthquake. Though, well, the, th the question now is how can we found these uh, bounds of friction? Because, you know, uh, field experiments, well, they are impossible to perform deep down in the earthquake. So the question is, well, how can we uh, finally manage to address this issue? And if I can reformulate and rephrase the question is actually how can we model well systems like uh, seismic faults that involve complex materials. And when I say complex materials, well, I want to refer to well, that broad range of materials that possess multiple inherent scales. So how these apply to earthquakes? Well, we, we know that the uh, finally the frictional behavior that we'd like to to, to, to understand of a seismic fault, uh, well, um, is depending of multiple inner and scale. Well, you see here schematically, we have a fault zone that is extending over several kilometers. Now, though, if we zoom over this region, what we observe, it's another scale. Uh, this time, well, these characteristic uh, lengths will be of the order of few centimeter. And at that scale, at this second one, well, we will record severe shear deformations. Though at this point, if we zoom even more, we will obtain and observe a third scale. That is the scale basically of the grains of the foliage of the poor network and where several thermohydromechanical couplings will take place. Now the pitch is that though, if we zoom back at the level of the folds, uh, the system at which we are interested, well, the frictional behavior of this guy here, well, it's basically depending on these multiple inner scales. So how we can uh, model uh, faults, seismic faults, if we have these, these dependence on multiple inner scales? Of course, so this will allow us finally to answer to the ultimate question is if we can tame earthquakes or not, but it's even a more general, um, answer a uh, question on how can we finally uh, model intricate system that displaying these multiple inner scales that might be uh, uh, might have application to other fields uh, geomechanics in general but also mechanical engineering 
additive manufacturing, biomechanics, and so more. So, well, when we are dealing with complex system like the one that you see uh, drawing here, uh, well, we have seen in the last decades the rise of multi-scale computational approaches that allow us basically to account for these multiple inherent scales by integrating a number of nested methods like the FEM or the DEM or hybrids like the FEM square. So independently of the approach that you want to use, the main idea is the following. We want to solve a macroscopic boundary value problem for our case will be a seismic pulse, but it might be general. Now let's assume that to solve this problem, well, we will rely on, uh, we are relying on a displacement based formulation so that to solve the boundary value problem, we will simply pass at each point of this macrostructure, the incrementing strain to another scale that is the microscopic scale uh, identified by a unit cell in which we will solve another problem that we define auxiliary problem. Once this has been done, we will return the incrementing stress that we just computed from the auxiliary problem to the original boundary value problem. Now, multi-scale approaches will allow us to model multiple uh, scale systems with high accuracy, though their bottleneck is the cumbersome and time-consuming uh, resolution and solution of the auxiliary problem in here. So in the last years, what we have tried is to design and develop some data-driven and deep learning approaches uh, to alleviate the computational burden of the solution of this auxiliary problem in multi-scale modeling. So the idea is to have some data that may come from uh, fine scale simulations or from laboratory experiments and use them to feed a neural network, for example, so that we are able to retrieve uh, the constitutive link between the incrementing strain and the incrementing stress. So, well, deep learning approaches like this one, uh, they demonstrate that, uh, well, they can really speed up multi-scale simulation, though they come with a price. And the price is that, uh, well, often deep learning models for material modeling, well, they lack of a framework based on physics. That is, nothing will guarantee us that a trained neural network, well, will be able to satisfy uh, some basic laws of physics. Now, there are some remedies, and I would like you to actually discuss with you of one of these remedies that are the thermodynamics-based artificial neural networks that uh, we developed, Yanis and I, one year ago, I think, and that I will refer it from now on simply as TAN. Now, before going and look at what actually this TAN uh, allow us to do, I would like very rapidly, uh, even if you're probably used to it, to recall the uh, thermodynamical framework on which TAN rely. So I will simply write down the first and second laws of thermodynamics uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of the closest to have inequality that you find here, especially locally, for a finite strain formulation. So you can find D, that is the mechanical dissipation rate density, S, the first piola kirchhoff stress tensor. Then we have F, that is the deformation gradient. C is the free energy density. Uh, eta is the entropy density, and then finally theta, that is the absolute temperature. Now, our, our goal is to model a macro scale system, complex system. And in this system, we can identify a given unit cell that uh, over it, we can perform a volume average of the closest you have inequality and come up with the equality that you see below, where uppercase letter are just denoting volume average of the uh, previous quantity. Now, at this point, if you want to continue in our theoretical development, well, we need to take and to make a choice. This choice concerns the state space. That is the set of variable on which the material response, material behavior is depending. So let's assume that the, space, the state space is identified by some state variables that I distinguish here between observable state variable, that is the temperature and a strain measure, and then an additional set of so-called internal state variable, Z, that we introduce to compensate for our lack of knowledge of what is going down there at the microstructure, and then finally manifest at the macro scale as irreversibility. Now, the identification of these internal uh, state variables is not a trivial task. Uh, I'm pretty sure that you might think to some physical quantities as, a, as, as with this name, with state variable. So I would like you to ask 
to make the abstraction with me of not uh, prescribing uh, the physical nature of these Z, these internal state variables. And as you will see, everything will be clear later on, I hope. So we can continue by writing down that the uh, free energy, the stresses and so on are actually functions of the state variable. And then by computing the time differentiation of the elastic energy, the free energy C in a classical way that we can substitute in the closest to Hamming inequality. Well, this will bring us with some thermodynamics restriction uh, that you see here below. The first one is the classical one. Stresses are the derivative of the elastic energy with respect to strains. Now, to simplify this talk, allow me to uh, restrict um, the processes at which we are interested to only isothermal processes, though the framework is general, as I rapidly present to you, and can be further extended to generalized continuum theories, if uh, needed, and to account for other uh, transient phenomena. So now let's see how we can basically translate these, well, thermodynamical uh, principles into a deep learning approach. So these are actually the thermodynamics-based artificial neural networks, TAN. And TAN rely on an incremental formulation of the material behavior. Uh, and they are, well, composed of different um, uh, building blocks. Uh, we have uh, as inputs the material state at time t uh, that you see here, plus the incrementing strain uh, at that same time, uh, that are the inputs of a deep network uh, that will predict the uh, well, the increment in the internal state variable delta z, and from that we simply have so the internal and observable uh, observable state variable at time t plus delta t, and we will have a second deep neural network that will predict the free energy at that same time. Now, though, as we said before, we are interested in characterizing the constitutive response, so finally the link between the formation and stresses. So while well, this is pretty straightforward in TAN, because we will simply enforce the thermodynamic restriction that we derived before uh, using auto differentiation within gradient descent algorithms. And so basically we'll come up with a deep network that is able to well characterize and predict uh, and model the material response by enforcing the universal laws of thermodynamics. So here, a rapid example, we apply TAN to predict the uh, hyper and hypoplastic material behaviors. So you see below actually the comparison between TAN and state-of-the-art uh, artificial neural network, ANN. And basically what you observe is that TAN uh, completely overpass the state-of-the-art. They allow us to have not only accurate prediction, but also reliable because we are well, building uh, the entire model based on the on the laws of thermodynamics. And as a result, uh, TAN are also, can also generalize extremely well for prediction outside of the training domain. And what we have seen as well is that if we feed TAN with some noisy data sets that might be realistic in case of laboratory experiments, well, TAN are extremely robust operator uh, against this noise. Though with the scheme that I just presented you, well, there might be a problem. And the problem, uh, it comes from the identification of the state variable. Uh, I said to you to make the abstraction and not prescribing their, their nature, uh, though at a certain point we will need to do it. So uh, the question is, uh, how can we finally identify the state variable? Uh, and uh, to rephrase it, how can we identify state variable in a general way for complex material, not only for uh, seismic poles, but I don't know, for uh, bones, for muscle, in a general way for complex material. So to do so, we need to introduce a new quantity that I define here as internal coordinates. So these internal coordinates are basically the microscopic um, uh, variable that characterize the state space. That is the, the internal degrees of freedom of the microstructure of this complex material that we want to model. Now, though, as you can imagine, uh, for complex material, uh, these internal coordinates will span high dimensional spaces. And so that dealing with them rather than with state variable, well, it might be not computationally efficient. So at this point, we can think to eventually develop and apply some model order reduction technique like PCA or autoencoders to feed them with internal coordinates and find a low dimensional parameterization of them 
And at that point, just cross the finger and hope that this low dimensional parameterization, this latent dimension, well, they are coinciding with a certain uh, state variable. Though this in general is not true because the model order reduction technique that you, you may use, well, you won't be aware of the underlying thermodynamics of the underlying physics of the problem. So, well, we won't find the internal state variable. So how we can finally perform such an identification? So here, the previous scheme of done. At this point, though, we don't know this internal state variable is Z in here, so we cannot build the, uh, the entire architecture. And to, to do so, we will simply replace the internal state variable by the output of an encoder that takes as input the internal coordinates. Um, so we have this latent dimension that feed the upper part of the network. And then we can eventually and additionally add a decoder that will perform the inverse transformation of the encoder that is will take this latent dimension and will give us and return us the internal coordinates. Now at this point though, if you train the, the scheme and the architecture as you see here, well, you will come up at the end of the training uh, in identifying an admissible set of state variable such that you can predict the uh, material stresses by enforcing the first and second laws of thermodynamics. So once we identify this state variable, well, we will simply erase the encoder. We don't need it anymore because we will basically operate with volume average quantity at the upper part of the scheme. Though at any point, uh, if needed, we can simply call the decoder and basically uh, decode the predicted uh, internal state variable into the microscopic state space of the material. That is, we can characterize the uh, microstructure and the evolution of the microstructure of the complex material. So let's look at some benchmark. Uh, I will show you a benchmark um, involving lattice structure. So nothing to do with seismic uh, faults. Uh, to simplify even more, I will consider that we are dealing with uh, a small strain formulation. Uh, so that basically you find the um, uh, stress tensor sigma, uh, the volume average of the stress tensor sigma, and then the uh, volume average of the infinitesimal uh, strain tensor, E. Uh, so to study this kind of structure, we implemented a finite element code uh, at the micro mechanical scale. And with that, we generate some micro mechanical data sets uh, from random loading paths that we use then to train TAN. So here's some of the results. So we have uh, just schematically represented two of the unit cell that we studied. So the first one that is regular, while the other one is not regular. And you see on the right the prediction of TAN with respect to the micro mechanical model that is the ground truth reality. So you can see how actually uh, accurate TAN are and well, how well they generalize outside of the training range. And then you see also on the right that we are able to track uh, the microstructural changes here in terms of the uh, uh, microscopic uh, displacement and the internal forces of the system. And then though at the end of the day, as I was saying, uh, well, the problem of multi-scale models is the computational cost. So we would like to know if TAN are fast enough. So, well, this is the case because if we compare TAN with the uh, reference micromechanical model, we notice that we have computational acceleration that are more than three orders of, three orders of magnitude. And these, while keeping an accuracy that is more than 99%. Um, so, though I start this presentation by talking about large scale problem, macro scale problem. And so, here one example, still with lattice structure. So we have a large scale problem involving a large uh, lattice structure. And to solve that using TAN, we will use uh, what is defined as FEN TAN approach. So basically we will model this lattice structure using a finite element model, a classical one, in which we will substitute the constitutive response by and with the uh, trained TAN so that we can basically um, characterize the constitutive link between stresses and deformation. Though at any time, think, thanks to the fact that we are able to identify the state variable from the uh, internal coordinates, from the microscopic state space, we are able to reconstruct and track the uh, changes in the microstructure at the level though of the large scale problem. So here I show you some application, a first one that is involving a simple torsion of the upper uh, bound of a lattice structure. 
And you see on the right, basically the FEN10 approach here in blue will rapidly converge to the ground truth reality, that is a microscopic model, as soon as the uh, size of the unit cell, that is epsilon, well, tends towards zero. This is in agreement with the asymptotic homogenization scheme on which we are relying, though the uh, FEN10 approach is basically independent of the scaling approach. You may use uh, computational homogenization if you are more comfortable with. And then let's look at another example. In here, we are applying a cyclic loading path, still torsion. So you see that we load in different direction the, uh, the structure. And then at the very end, we simply unload the structure that will find a new equilibrium point. So on the right, uh, you see actually how well the FEN10 approach perform with respect to the um, uh, micromechanical model. This with still with computational acceleration of several order of magnitudes. And particularly interesting is to notice uh, the evolution of one of the state variables that the system identified. So as you can see at the very end, in the unloading part, uh, we have this state variable that is different from, from zero. This means that actually the uh, model uh, that I present to you is able to well identify and characterize irreversible deformation even at the macroscopic level. So though up to now I showed you only lattice structure um, and this is why because well we are actually uh, it's ongoing the application of TAN to model granular media. So what we are doing in here is to develop novel model order reduction technique to encode the microscopic state space. So here you see, for example, the reconstruction of the uh, microscopic displacement in a granular media. And this will allow us in the near future to, uh, well, answer to the ultimate question is if earthquake control is possible. And of course, this will allow us to find uh, bounds for the friction in seismic fault, thanks to TAN. Uh, though TAN are general and can be applied also to other problems, this will basically consist in the uh, use of TAN to develop digital twins, this is a straightforward application, and also to model other complex materials. So at this point, I would like to uh, acknowledge the few people that collaborate in this work. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. Thank you.